As the creator of Animation Look Back, I've always had a fascination when we look into the behind the scenes of our favorite movies and watch firsthand how the magic of filmmaking works. Naturally, animation has always been a favorite medium of mine because not only does it stand out from all other films, but also the process is very unique by the sheer amount of creativity and effort to literally bring a drawing to life. It actually helps give the process much more admiration when you know the people responsible for it along with the thinking process and what they had to go through to make the thing. That's why I've always been a fan of documentaries, where it gives you that window of opportunity to witness that moment in time when those projects were created and have a chance to know the people who made them. And that's why I want to do something to give back to those documentaries something that would give them a moment to shine so that others could check it out and experience for themselves the real magic that went into the tunes. Now for this top 10, I have two rules for what could make it on the list. One, it has to be feature length, and by that I mean more than an hour. And two, the subject of the documentary has to be about animation, or at least about someone heavily involved with the medium. I'm Animat, and this is the Top 10 Documentaries on Animation. someone who never took charge in an animated project like being either a producer or a director. But he is very well known in the industry for putting his mark in countless of beloved projects. From the Disney classics like Sleeping Beauty, The Sword in the Stone, and The Jungle Book, to Hanna-Barbera shows like Jabberjaw and Godzilla, to Pixar films like Toy Story 2 and Monsters, Inc., to works that are more recent like 2013's Free Birds. This is not to mention that he did work for some of the biggest names in the industry, including Walt Disney himself, Bill Hanna and Joe Barbera, Tex Avery, John Lasseter, Pete Docter, among many others. This documentary goes into the crazy life that Floyd went into, going into each project he worked on and how he would always find himself in a new studio, making story art that would be completely different from the last project he worked on. On top of that, he would also show a bit of his struggles just for who he is, like being one of the first ever black animators and the first one to work at Disney, along with how the company forced him to retire, since he never has any plans to do so. However, they're not as problematic as they seem, since an animated life presents itself much like Floyd's attitude, always upbeat, unaware that his race plays a factor in his life, and sprinkled with some humor, including some animated segments made by aspiring animators. If I do have to pick out a flaw with this documentary, it's that much like Floyd's career, it is pretty unfocused. Every few minutes after his time at Disney in the 60s, it would always switch the subject of what's going on in his life. You could start from when he co-founded Vignette Films, then suddenly it'll go into his love life with his first wife, then suddenly get himself involved with Fat Albert. It's like the documentary tries so hard to cram in all 80 years of Floyd's life into 90 minutes, on top of putting those animated segments and some slice of life moments. But even at that, it still works as a tribute to one of the very few people who worked with many of the great legends, both old and new. In the animation industry, he's pretty much like Jigo from Princess Mononoke. Can be a bit of a troublemaker when you cross his path, but he's just a humble artist trying to get by. Old school Disney, new school Disney. You're both worlds. And I live in both worlds, mm -hmm. so, you know. If you're an animation fan, chances are that you have heard about the movie called The Thief and the Cobbler. And I don't necessarily mean the movie itself, but rather how it got the record for the longest production time for not just an animated film, but for a movie in general. Taking almost three decades from the start in 1964, all the way up to when it finally got into theaters in the 90s. 
This documentary captures the complete story of when animator Richard Williams attempted to create what he called his masterpiece, and never giving up on trying to create what would have been the greatest animated feature of all time. In a way, it's not just about the thief and the cobbler, but it's also a bit biographical on the life of Richard Williams and his accomplishments, showing that every project that he and his studio worked on from the countless of commercials, title sequences for movies like some of the Pink Panther films, and even Who Framed Roger Rabbit were all done in order to independently fund the movie. Not to mention all of the awards that he has gotten, including the big ones like Oscars, Emmys, BAFTAs, Annies, and so much more. Although the documentary does a great job highlighting the production's history, along with mentioning some of the animators who worked on it, like Ken Harris and Art Babbitt, it really does have a somber tone. Considering how William's original vision got ruined by the Completion Bond Company, it portrays the Thief and the Cobbler as a tragedy like the Titanic, where all the years of hard work by many talented artists have been completely destroyed and entirely wasted. On top of mentioning how Dick himself would never want to talk about the film ever again. It is true that it's soul crushing that a project with some of the greatest pieces of animation would become. Well, whatever the fridge that is. It does skip over some of the events that would shine a light after the film was released, like Gary Gilchrist's unofficial recobbled cut and a restoration attempt by Walt Disney Animation Studios. Also, some could say that the documentary can be a bit dated because The Thief and the Cobbler does have a happier ending now than what Persistence portrays. Not only is Williams more comfortable to publicly talk about the feature, but also the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences would hold special events to screen the official unfinished director's cut, which is subtitled A Moment in Time. So nowadays, with its popularity growing among the filmmaking and animation community, on top of an awareness boost from the documentary itself, maybe there is hope that one day we will see a complete version of The Thief and the Cobbler that Richard Williams always envisioned it to be when he was making it those three crazy decades. But for all the events that happened during those decades, we will always have this to give us a vision of what it could be. Well, this is an old-fashioned. I've, I've mastered this medium at last. And I'm going to do a masterpiece, I hope, if I can ever finish the thing. <laughs> when you think about some of the greatest cartoons of not just the Looney Tunes, but even the greatest cartoons ever, you'll find that many of them were done by Chuck Jones, and this documentary highlights exactly why. Now, this is not necessarily your typical documentary, nor is it a biography on the life of Chuck Jones as one would probably expect. Instead, this acts more like a feature-length essay on why Jones cartoons are often considered some of the best, analyzing every aspect that goes into them, It'll talk about the characters he made, like Wile E. Coyote and the Roadrunner, his interpretation of characters like Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck, how he approaches storyboards, the layouts, the backgrounds, his direction on the voice acting, the animation, his sense of timing, the music, and so much more. This is on top of highlighting some of his greatest accomplishments both during and after the Looney Tunes to present great examples of how these aspects work together, like One Froggy Evening, Feed the Kitty, What's Opera Doc, and The Dot and the Line. In a way, it almost approaches these cartoons in a scientific level to know why Chuck Jones cartoons are both timeless and funny along with mentioning the many other people that would contribute to Chuck's success, like Ken Harris animation, Mel Blanc's voice, and Maurice Noble's backgrounds. If you want to see it for yourself, you can get your complete fill of Chuck Jones on Volume 1 of the Looney Tunes Platinum Collection. But like I said before, this could confuse people thinking that this would be more about Chuck Jones' life instead of his cartoons. I mean, it does go into a bit of his biography, but that's only in the first 15 minutes and in the end. If you're looking for something that's more about Chuck Jones himself, then you should try the 1991 Chuckamuck the Movie, 
a 50-minute documentary that's more about Jones while also taking some time to see him draw the characters. So instead of having a course on comedy to learn about the importance of timing, Chuck-a-Muck gives you a drawing class on how to draw Bugs Bunny. And, uh... Oh, you had the very earliest Mickey Mouse. Whoops! <laughs> Wrong class. Uh, maybe I should go see Mark Davis to draw Bugs. But if you ever need to learn about why the greatest cartoons are the greatest cartoons, then let Chuck demonstrate to you how it's done. I'm directing over 300 cartoons in the last 50 or 60 years. Hopefully, this means you've forgiven me. Now here we have two of the biggest influences in art that you'd never expect to work together. Walt Disney and master surreal artist Salvador Dali. With that said, what the fridge do these two have in common? Well, back in the mid 40s, they originally wanted to create a unique animated short called Destino, which would have literally been a Dali painting coming to life. But they sadly didn't complete it due to Disney's financial troubles after World War II. However, unlike The Thief and the Cobbler, it wouldn't be until 2003 when the short would finally be complete with the help of Roy E. Disney, Baker Bloodworth, and Dominique Montferri, which now we could say that they ended up making an Oscar-nominated short. With the documentary, which is about 12 times longer than the short itself, it's actually very interesting how it clearly has a three-act structure. The first looks into the life of both Dolly and Disney up to when they first met along with some similarities to how they grew up, their rise of fame, and the art that they craft. The second goes into the making of the short itself, where Dolly was working with story artist John Hench on the storyboards. And finally, in the third act, we fast forward 50 years later when Walt's nephew Roy picked the project back up to finish what his uncle and Dolly started by mixing some classic and contemporary animation with hand-drawn and computer. The whole purpose of this documentary is to give a perfectly clear understanding of what Destino is all about, both as a collaborative work between two masters of their own art and what the symbolisms of the short mean. Seriously, I highly recommend watching the documentary before the short. Otherwise, there's a good chance you'll end up lost in the sea of abstract weirdness. However, Dolly and Disney is actually pretty hard to find nowadays. The only way that you could officially get the documentary is in the Blu-ray of Fantasia and Fantasia 2000, which fortunately comes with the short as well in beautiful high definition. I always say that animation can be simply described as art that was brought to life, and there could be no better proof than with Destino. Among Walt's nine old men, Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston are not only two of the most recognizable of the group, but they are also the most beloved duo in the history of animation. So much so that Brad Bird gave them cameos in The Iron Giant and The Incredibles. Hey, you see that? Yeah, that's the way to do it. That's old school. Yeah? <laughs> no school like the old school. <laughs> in fact, you can't even mention one of them without bringing up the other. That is because, on top of being great colleagues, they have also been great friends ever since they were young adults before joining Disney. This is what this documentary is all about. How their friendship was the driving force of both their animation careers and personal life. When you look into their work at Disney, there were many times when it was demanded that they have to work together to have their characters interact. Like Alice and the Queen of Hearts in Alice in Wonderland, Captain Hook and Mr. Smee in Peter Pan, and Flora, Fauna, and Merryweather in Sleeping Beauty. Plus, you also get some really cute moments where Frank and Ollie reenact some of the scenes they've animated. Come to, <clears throat> come to think of it, if, if I was a pirate, I, I, I wouldn't hide anything back there. Another hiss out of you, uh, 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 hiss, and you are walking to Nottingham. But this is not just about them together. 
It also takes a look at the two individually with some of their personal differences. Like Ollie is a huge fan of trains to the point of owning his own locomotive, and Frank is very fond of music. In fact, he's one of the members of Disney's Dixieland band Firehouse 5 Plus 2. Now, as someone who has actually read The Illusion of Life cover to cover, and seriously, if you're a fan of animation, it's almost mandatory to read this. It's like the Old Testament of animation. This documentary is like the closest thing to a film adaptation of the book, mentioning some of the influences and examples of great works and share that personal charm that feels like they're right next to you telling their story. They even give you their perspective on what happened in the studio while they were working there, like the tough times of World War II, and learn about why the Jungle Book's success was so important to the company after Walt's death. We've seen a lot of friendships bloom in Disney films, like Bambi and Thumper, Mowgli and Baloo, and Todd and Copper. But the greatest friends of them all are the ones who animated them. Never mind all that! Get to the part where I lose my temper. And Takahata Isao Kaguya Hime no Monogatari o Tsukuru. The reason why I put these two together is because they both have very strong similarities. They're both about the most acclaimed directors of Studio Ghibli, they both look into the making of their last movie, and they were both made at the same time. However, there are some clear differences between the two. Okay, yes, one's about Hayao Miyazaki and the other's about Aiseo Takahata, that's a given. But what I mean is that Kingdom focuses on Miyazaki himself, while Kaguya looks more into the making of the movie. With the help of these documentaries, we get a chance to know more about these two legendary filmmakers both personally and how they make their films. But when it comes to making some of the best Japanese animated features, there's no way it could come without some challenges brought upon by both directors. Miyazaki is a strict man who only demands the best out of his animators, on top of being naturally bitter and grumpy all the time, in a way that he describes as being a 20th century man living in the 21st century. With Takahata, there is nothing he hates more than to make animated films in the traditional format. He always wanted to experiment with new and different ways to make his movies through trial and error with no care about the deadline. Rather they be using brown outlines for Grave of the Fireflies, an utterly more cartoony style than other Ghibli films like with My Neighbor the Yamadas, or keeping the rough sketches in the final film with the tale of the Princess Kaguya. They are far from ideal directors to work with, but the end result with all the hard work from hundreds of artists and animators is what makes the production all worth it. I will say though that it is pretty obvious how Miyazaki is marketed as the more popular one at Ghibli, since you can get Kingdom on its own DVD, but with Takahata's, it's only available with the Blu-ray and DVD of Princess Kaguya. It's extremely rare to find some footage of what goes on behind the scenes at Studio Ghibli, but luckily, not only do these documentaries capture two master Japanese filmmakers working in their craft, but they filmed them when they were making their final feature film. You know, as excited as I am about this news, there's still that part of me that just looks back at what I just said and I look at this and ask, Really? And what would follow is the untold story of Ub Iwerks. Out of all the animation pioneers, from Windsor McKay to Lott Reiniger to Walt Disney to Willis O'Brien to Ed Catmull, Ub Iwerks is probably the one that people seem to forget the most. Mostly known for co-creating Mickey Mouse, his legacy and the innovations that he has done for animation are far bigger than anyone could ever imagine. Created by Ub Iwerks' granddaughter, Leslie Iwerks, the documentary dives into his entire career along with many of the crazy inventions he made in order to bring his cartoons to the next level. 
What's actually interesting is that you could tell in his early works, like in Alice's Comedies and Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, that he does have an inventor's mindset like his father did, since some of the gags have a theme of engineering. When he would take a break from Disney for several years to work at MGM on Flip the Frog and Willy Whopper, he would return to Walt as his technical genius. He already developed the multiplane camera, but then he would also create the technique for mixing live action with animation starting with the three caballeros and bring xerography to animation to cut out the hand inking process starting with 101 Dalmatians. But his ingenuity wouldn't be limited to cartoons. Iwerks also got an Oscar nomination for using the sonium vapor process in Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds and helped develop many classic attractions at Disneyland. If this documentary proved anything, Ub was one of, if not the most important figure that helped shape the Disney company into what it is today other than Walt and Roy. Not only was he Walt's first ever creative partner and a talented animator with a great sense of timing that made both Oswald and Mickey a star, but a legendary inventor that brought the entertainment industry to new heights. Sadly, this is one of those documentaries that are pretty hard to find nowadays. The only way you could get it is by the Walt Disney Treasures DVD set of Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. And let me tell ya, <laughs> nowadays, the key word with these sets to describe their rarity is treasures. But once you have it and see the documentary for yourself, you'll get to learn a lot about the most underrated figure in Disney history. Without Ub, Walt probably couldn't have done some of the things he did. Without Walt, Ub's inventions wouldn't have been put to such good use. Okay, technically I'm cheating on this one because this is more about autism than it is about animation itself. But there is still a connection with the latter. While all the other documentaries on this list are about the people who make the animation, this one looks into the group of people that play a very important part that's often overlooked, and that is the viewer. Based on the book of the same name by Ron Suskind, the documentary was able to take those pages and put them onto the screen. The only big difference is where the book tells the point of view of Ron, this one is from the point of view of the main subject of Life Animated, his son, Owen. You see, Owen has autism, and as a child, he was incapable of speaking and had a massive difficulty to develop. As you can imagine, one of the biggest struggles with autism is to communicate with the world around the person. However, throughout Owen's life, he has one tool that he uses as an aid in order to understand the world around him, and that is Disney films. It's what he uses to communicate, to express how he feels, to show what he wants, and more. In the documentary, we take a look at two different parts in Owen's life. His past, where he has to learn about how to grow up and cooperate with autism, accompanied by some original animation by McGuff, and the present time when the crew was filming him, right where he graduated and is taking his first big steps to living on his own. Rather if you have autism or not, there are many things to find that can be relatable with Owen. Some can bring back joyful memories, and others can remind you of going through similar hardships where reality is saying that life is not a Disney film. While it does offer a clear understanding of what autism is, it also explains the power of Disney's animated features. They're not just made for entertainment, but they can also teach people how to feel and to pursue their goals. If you're watching this, then there's a high chance that there is at least one that heavily influenced your life to become who you are today. Maybe it's the journey the heroes go through, maybe it's a character you highly enjoyed and admired, or maybe it's the message that you keep as a philosophy for your life. Regardless of the case, there is a little side in all of us that's just like Owen where we would want to live in a Disney world. But what can I say? That's what Disney does to you. And Owen is just one example of taking on life, one animated moment at a time. My childhood days were over. That doesn't matter. The 
they have revolutionized an industry and blazed an unprecedented record in Hollywood history. This is the Pixar story. Back in the 2000s, everybody recognized Pixar as the modern kings of animation, capable of releasing masterpiece after masterpiece. If there's one thing that the Pixar story taught me, it's that maintaining such a reputation is never easy. Once again made by Leslie Iwerks, this Emmy-nominated documentary takes a look at the entire early history of Pixar Animation Studios. From their very beginnings as a new division at LucasArts formed by George Lucas, to when Bob Iger was the new CEO of Disney and purchased the entirety of Pixar for $7.4 billion while they were ready to release Cars. But it's not just about the studio. It also focuses on the two big heads of the company since the start, John Lasseter and Ed Catmull whom individually discovered this new medium of 3D animation and dream of creating the world's first computer animated feature film. If this were handed by any other documentarian, they would have chronicled the struggles of the studio before Toy Story and then afterwards present the rest like it's smooth sailing. The reality of what it shows, however, is that the challenges never cease to end and with every new project comes a horrifying question. Can they successfully make their first movie with Toy Story? Can they prove that they're more than just a one-hit wonder with A Bug's Life? Are they able to make follow-up films with Toy Story 2? How will Pete Docter do with Monsters, Inc.? How will Andrew Stanton follow with Finding Nemo? Can an outside director like Brad Bird make a Pixar-quality film with The Incredibles? All these questions and more have brought fear to the people at Pixar, and they still do today with the movies that they're currently making. If anything, this documentary would give its audience a brand new admiration and understanding for the studio that with great movies comes so much hard work and obstacles to avoid. I was honestly amazed at the Pixar story so much that it was honestly a great help and inspiration when I was making Animation Look Back Pixar. And even watching the documentary now, it brings me back to when I was making that series and got me excited about Pixar all over again. Although you can get this on its own digitally, the only place where you can find it, either on DVD or Blu-ray, would actually be with Wally, -E, which is perfectly fine since it's one of those movies that you must have in your household anyways. But if you ever need an extra reason to love Pixar even more, then there's no better story than a Pixar story. Pixar is seen by a lot of folks as an overnight success, but if you really look closely, most overnight successes took a long time. Now before we take a look at the ultimate documentary that talks about animation, I would like to have an honorable mention. From beautiful downtown Burbank, I know that voice. Now here we have a documentary that's about one of the many important components that goes into animation, and that is voice acting. It gives you an entire insight on voice acting for cartoons and living as a voiceover artist with interviews from many of the most recognizable names in the industry. Some of these include Tom Kenny, Charlie Atler, E.G. Daly, Rob Paulson, Tara Strong, Mark Hamill, Jim Cummings, Chris Summers, Steve Bradley Baker, Ed Asner, Bill Farmer, Nancy Carberry, John DiMaggio, and just so much more. <sighs> Oh boy, I can't even fill the entire list or even just a fraction of it. Oh, by the way, the last one I mention is also the creator of the documentary. Through their words, they give the audience a lot that they need to know about the industry and how it works, like the history of voice acting and how it all began, the influence of legends like Mel Blanc and June Foray, some of their techniques, and their moments of fame at conventions. Also, the important thing to note about voice acting is that this is an industry filled with weirdos and goofballs, aka my kind of people. So the tone of the feature would emulate that by seeing the voice actors just having fun and do weird tasks like reading Shakespeare in their character. They have their eclipses and entrances. And uh, one man in his time plays many parts. His ex being seven ages. If I do have to pick out a criticism in this, is that this only looks into a fraction of what goes into voice acting. Sure, animation is the one that's the most fun and interesting to work on, and it does get into a few other aspects like video games and anime dubbing, but that's only a fraction of the voiceover business. 
especially when they're mainly focusing on voices for animated series done in LA. It would have been also nice to learn more about how they got into the business to give some tips for aspiring actors and go into other elements of voices like commercials, audiobooks, narrations for various projects, and more. But again, I understand focusing primarily on doing animated characters, since this is made to commemorate the fun part of voice acting and the people involved with it. Plus, you even get to see how fun they can have when doing their job. It's a loving tribute to all the people you listen to and made you shout out... Well, the moment you've been waiting for has finally arrived. May I present to you... Animation Look Back! Nah, I'm just kidding. The real number one documentary on animation is... This is the story of how we got there. This is the story about 10 of the craziest years that Walt Disney Animation Studios had to go through. From 1984, when the animators were working on the inevitable flop that would become the Black Cauldron, to 1994, when they were the champions of animation as they were about to release The Lion King. The documentary takes a look into three different perspectives during that whole scenario, all beautifully handled with each equally having their moment to tell this one epic story. The first is from the narrator Don Hahn, a producer at Disney and the director of the documentary. The second is from the eager and young new animators who have the large responsibility of carrying the torch that was previously held by the nine old men. If that's not stressful enough, they have to work every day not knowing if they'll even have a job the next day. The third and final point of view is from the new heads of the Disney company. These include Roy E. Disney, Michael Eisner, Jeffrey Katzenberg, and Frank Wells. As the company got bigger with the success of The Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast, it became a three-way brawl with Jeffrey, Michael, and Roy, but Frank was the peacemaker of the group to keep them all together so they can properly let the animation studio blossom without any crazy fights. On top of that, it also highlights some of the other people who did play a factor in Disney's success during that time, including Peter Schneider and Howard Ashman, one of the biggest components of this documentary in order to have the audience fully invested is how it emulates the emotions that happened during that time. It truly gives out that feeling of dread when the fate of the studio was in danger by being the company's weakest asset. The sense of hope rising when Who Framed Roger Rabbit and The Little Mermaid were finally a hit for the studio. The utter sadness when Howard Ashman passed away of AIDS and the intensity between the big heads when they have to fight each other in order to win the title of being portrayed by the media as the next Walt Disney. The reason why this made it into number one is because it perfectly covers the events of what could be the most important moment of modern animation history. The time when that spark occurred that regained the interest of the public in animation and would let the industry grow into what it is today. And I don't mean just because they're now some of the most successful films in recent years. They can have the power to have anybody understand the world around them. The greatest. I am the greatest. How forgotten projects can get a second chance. I'm the same. I, I just want to do something good. Old people who can draw are now considered legends. They really pioneered this type of, of animation. They brought personality animation to even where Walt thought it could go. And of course, turning a group of artists into unsung heroes. If there's one thing I've learned from watching these documentaries and making animation look back, it's that sometimes the making of the story can tell a better story than the story itself.